Hello everyone. My name is Priya Dikshit. I work at Samsung Semiconductor India R&D Center and today I will present the topic Understanding Linux Interrupt Subsystem. In this presentation, we will be covering a lot of things like what are interrupts and uh, how are they triggered, uh, various types of uh, interrupts, then uh, what are interrupt controller and their significance, generic interrupt handling, uh, here we will check how interrupts are handled regardless of the interrupt controller used. The main part of the presentation is understanding the generic interrupt subsystem framework. Under this, we will see a few important data structures used and uh, how are they linked to each other. Generic interrupt handling process. Uh, we will then see high level driver APIs and uh, see how different driver can call these APIs without uh, knowing anything about the interrupt details. This way, high-level APIs can be used on different platform without the code changes. After that, we will be checking the currently running interrupt from the user space and uh, then the various configurations related to debugging interrupts. Why are interrupts needed? Many times hardware device may need to communicate to the CPU. Communications might be needed for the cases like some error got generated or say a hardware device has some request. So for CPU to process these hardware device requests, we can use two methods. First is polling method and the other is interrupt method. In polling method, CPU keeps on checking if any device has any request. So this decreases the throughput of the system. Uh, CPU is continuously in the loop check for the hardware device, irrespective of if the device wants any communication or not. As the second method to use is interrupt method. This is a preferred method where CPU takes care of hardware only when hardware device has some request. So in interrupt mode, the microprocessor will execute its main program and stop only when hardware device interrupt the CPU. Linux handles the interrupt in the same way it handles signals in the user space. Generally speaking, an interrupt is physically produced electronic signal originating from hardware device and directed into the processor. The processor detects the signal, uh, interrupts its current execution and call the special routine that service the interrupt. Once the servicing is completed, the processor would resume exactly where it left off. This event that caused the interruption is called interrupt and the special routine executed to service the interrupt is called interrupt service routine. Using interrupts, the overall system throughput can be increased. That is why this is the preferred method. Interrupts can be of many different types based on how we classify them. Uh, let us start with hardware and software interrupts. The interrupts caused by external signals are referred as hardware interrupts and the uh, interrupts caused by special instructions are called software interrupts. Timer ticks, network card and uh, keyboard are example of hardware interrupt. Uh, while the most common example of software interrupts would be page fault, overflow instruction, division by zero, etc. Then they are maskable and non-maskable interrupts. Simply, the interrupts which can be ignored are maskable and the interrupts which cannot be ignored are non-maskable interrupts. Usually the interrupts which cannot be delayed or should be processed by the processor immediately are non-maskable. Uh, this could be a critical event such as hardware failure. Uh, on the other hand, maskable interrupts can be delayed when a much higher priority interrupt occur and uh, this uh, cause the other interrupts in a waste, wait state. All the interrupts request issued by input output device give rise to the maskable interrupts. Let us see few more types, shared interrupts. Uh, since there are limited interrupt lines available on every SOC, uh, this was the basic need for shared interrupt. Ideally, one IQ line can serve one device as we saw in the previous diagram, but this is not enough in few cases. As a solution, modern hardware has been designed to allow sharing an interrupt line among a couple of devices. 
So uh, when two devices or two or more devices use the same interrupt line or the same IRQ number, it is called shared interrupt. A spurious interrupt is a signal of very short duration uh, on one of the interrupt line. Uh, it is slightly uh, maybe caused due to signal glitch. Uh, we can say uh, spurious interrupts are false interrupts or bad interrupts. There is a separate file spurious.c in Linux kernel for handling these kinds of interrupts. The ARM specific GIC that is generic interrupt controller has different type of interrupt sources like PPI, SPI, SGI. We will be discussing about interrupt controllers in the upcoming slide. So for the time being, let's discuss its classification. Private peripheral interrupt, PPI. These per, uh, peripheral interrupts are private to one core and cannot be executed on other core. An example of PPI uh, would be a generic timer for uh, each of the core. Then shared peripheral interrupts, SPI. Peripheral interrupts that could be, that cannot be, uh, like there is no restriction and uh, that could be delivered to any of the cores, shared peripheral interrupts, means uh, that is shared among the different cores. Then there is software generated interrupt, SGI. SGI are typically used for inter-process communication and uh, these are generated by writing to the specific SGI register in GIC. Each interrupt uh, signal input is designed to be either a uh, signal level or signal edge. The level sensitive input continuously requests processor service as long as particular level high or low uh, is applied to the input. Uh, as sensitive uh, input reacts to signal edges, particularly whether rising or falling. So it is present for a comparatively shorter duration. We can say a uh, level triggered signifies the state while edge trigger signifies the event. On assigning a trigger level for interrupts, we may keep few things in mind. Like uh, if the interrupt is configured as level triggered, it is impossible to lose them, but we need extra care of clearing them. For edge triggered, you get an interrupt when the line changes from inactive to active state, but only once. We can also say uh, like a uh, level trigger interrupt require feedback uh, to interrupt source in order to reset it. Uh, this feedback may be some sort of acknowledgement or disabling the interrupt line for time being, anything will work. While as trigger doesn't need it because it is just for a pulse. Uh, but this could also be seen as drawback of as triggered uh, because hardware generated glitches, uh, we can say the spurious interrupts may get as triggered interrupt falsely asserted. With these uh, level triggered interrupt, in the, um, in the interrupt handler has to pull each of the device which are sharing the interrupt line to determine which device actually caused the interrupt. So interrupt sharing is also the key difference between as triggered and the level triggered. While the level triggered interrupts can be shared, the as triggered interrupts should not be. Interrupt controller. Interrupt controller's main function is to manage interrupts coming from different hardware devices. Interrupt lines are often limited, so the interrupt controller multiplexes several possible input sources on the platform and send one high priority interrupt to the processor at a time. It does so based on uh, types of interrupt, like if it is non-maskable interrupt, it is given a higher priority. And uh, similarly, for different maskable uh, interrupts, we can assign different priorities. Also in the in interrupt controller, uh, we can mask some of the interrupts that uh, do not occur at a particular time. Uh, we can set different priorities for different interrupts such that the higher priority is serviced and uh, then we take the next lower priority interrupt. For the multi-core system, we can set interrupt affinity as well, which means the particular interrupt with affinity to core zero will run on core zero only. As we earlier saw what are shared interrupts, 
So using interrupt controller, we can assign a common interrupt line for multiple hardware devices as well. Uh, interrupt controller also cause reduction in interrupt latency. Uh, this can be done by automatically saving and restoring the register contents, uh, which results in uh, reduce the delay. There are various type of interrupt controllers available like uh, VIC that is vectored interrupt controller, PIC is programmable interrupt controller, NVIC is nested vector interrupt controller to name a few. In the upcoming slides, we have chosen GIC, that is generic interrupt controller from ARM as an example. Till now we have covered what are interrupts, their types, how are they triggered and the need for interrupt controller. We will now see various interrupt controllers use generic interrupt framework. Uh, the generic interrupt handling layer is designed to provide complete abstraction of interrupt handling for the device drivers. A device driver use generic APIs to request, uh, to enable, disable, and free IR queues. Uh, these drivers do not know anything about the interrupt hardware details, so they can be used on different platforms without any code changes. In the upcoming slide, we will see a few important structures that are used for generic IRQ subsystem implementation and the relationship with each other. How these structures are being used in generic interrupt APIs, we will also cover this. So the bottom line is to understand how the uh, interrupts are being served irrespective of what interrupt controller is being used. The important data structures used in generic interrupt framework are IRQ domain, IRQ desk, IRQ data, IRQ chip. These structures in some way are linked to each other. In the coming slide, we will see these structures and their uses in detail. But for now, let's see the relationship between them. So here we can see that IRQ uh, data is being passed down to IRQ chip structure and uh, IRQ data also contains a pointer to IRQ chip structure and IRQ domain structure, while the IRQ data itself is embedded into IRQ disk. So we can say that IRQ chip and IRQ disk are also linked to each other using IRQ data. We will jump back to the slide again after we understand all these structures in detail. Uh, the first structure is IRQ domain. This structure is used for hardware interrupt number translation. What is interrupt number translation and why is it needed? We will see this in this slide. Uh, let us start simple. The interrupt number for a particular device given in device tree is called Linux IRQ number and the interrupt controller's local interrupt number is called hardware IRQ number. When there is a only a single interrupt controller in the system, the same IRQ number that is from the device tree can be used as controller local IRQ number that is hardware IRQ. But in the system with multiple controllers, the kernel must ensure that each one gets assigned non-overlapping allocations of IRQ number. For this reason, we need a mechanism to separate controller local interrupt number from the Linux IRQ number. The controller local number is allotted using IRQ domain operations, uh, which we will be seeing in the next slide. These uses the IRQ domain structure. So IRQ domain structure includes IRQ domain ops as a member. Then here name is the name of interrupt domain. Uh, host data uh, is the data pointer to be used by a particular interrupt controller. This is not touched by IRQ domain code. And uh, then there are some flags we may assign. Um, FW node is the pointer to the device tree node associated with the IRQ domain. This is used when we are using the uh, when we are uh, decoding the device tree using interrupt specifiers. Uh, so we can summarize by saying IRQ domain helps in translating the device tree interrupt representation that is Linux IRQ number into the hardware IRQ number that can be mapped back to Linux IRQ without any extra platform code. These are all the possible APIs uh, for domain operations. 
here we see that uh, IRQ domain structure is being passed in each of the operation. The match operation matches the interrupt control and node to the host. Uh, then map operation creates or uh, create or update the mapping between virtual IRQ and hardware IRQ. And map deletes such mapping. The mapping between IRQ, uh, Linux IRQ number and the hardware IRQ number is created by calling a one function IRQ create mapping. This will also allocate a new IRQ desk structure and associate with the hardware IQ number. Here we will also set up IRQ desk structure while returning from this map function. Uh, this IRQ desk is another important structure that we will be looking in detail in the coming slides. So when the interrupt is received, we can call find IRQ function to find the Linux IRQ number from the hardware IQ. In the previous slide, uh, we saw many IRQ do uh, domain operations are provided, but it depends on a particular interrupt controller among those which want to define. Here, uh, in case of GIC that we have took the example of, uh, we have defined only a few IRQ operations. How to define these operations also depend on particular interrupt controller. Like uh, in this example, GIC IRQ domain alloc we are doing the prime task of uh, IRQ domain mapping, but in its own way using generic IRQ domain structure. Here are the key points to note. IRQ domain is tied uh, to the node of interrupt controller in device tree. This structure shows the relation between global interrupt number to the local one. The IRQ alloc desk and IRQ free desk API provide allocations and deallocations of IRQ number. When an interrupt is received, IRQ find mapping function should be used to find Linux IRQ number from the hardware IRQ number. Uh, IRQ disk structure. Each interrupt has its own interrupt descriptor structure called IRQ disk. In the previous slide, we saw how domain operations allocate the IRQ structure with all the details. Uh, this is a very big structure. Let us uh, try to understand few of its important member. IRQ data uh, is the member of IRQ disk. We will be seeing a lot about IRQ data in the coming slides. Uh, here we also have interrupt flow handler as a member, then actions define uh, the interrupt action chain. Uh, that is the actions to be taken at the occurrence of interrupts. This structure holds various information uh, or description about the interrupt file, uh, like here is case state IRQ, uh, which gives IRQ state per CPU. Then we have total IRQ count, uh, total count, IRQ count, etc. Uh, the debug FS file is the D entry for debug FS file, and dev name is the flow handler name for proc interrupts output. Uh, these are quite helpful in debugging interrupts. The important thing is whenever the interrupt trigger, the low level architecture code calls this generic uh, interrupt code by handle IQ function. Let us have a quick recap of uh, IRQ disk structure. It contains all the core information, includes interrupt handler function, provides one-to-one -one mapping to the Linux interrupt number, and the IRQ struct data is embedded here. Uh, IRQ data. IRQ data is per chip data, interrupt per chip data. This structure is being passed down to IRQ chip coming next. Uh, let us have a view of what the member does. Uh, here the mask is pre-computed bit mask for assessing the chip registers. IRQ is the interrupt number. Hardware IRQ is a hardware interrupt number that is local to the interrupt domain. Uh, common points to the data shared by all IRQ chip. IRQ chip is a low level uh, interrupt hardware access. And this we will be seeing more in the coming slide. Uh, domain is the interrupt domain translation. This is responsible for mapping uh, between hardware IRQ and Linux IRQ number. This we have already covered in the previous slides. Uh, so 
uh, I, uh, let us have a recap of IRQ data. This is embedded into IRQ desk structure. Uh, this contains both uh, hardware IRQ number and Linux IRQ number, contain pointer to the IRQ chip structure, provide link between IRQ chip and IRQ disk structure. IRQ chip. IRQ chip is a hardware interrupt chip descriptor that includes all the functions defined by interrupt chip or we can say controller. Here name is the name for proc interrupts. Uh, IRQ enable enables the interrupt, IRQ disable disables the interrupt and so on. Uh, this is basically a long list of all the interrupt chip functions that can be defined by a particular interrupt controller. IRQ chip structure, uh, so we have covered what is IRQ chip structure. Let us have a quick recap. The structure is used to interrupt with hardware at a very low level. A set of method describes how to drive the interrupt controller directly called by IRQ code. Uh, like we showed in IRQ domain, uh, likely, like, according to the need of particular interrupt controller, we can define the functions which we need to implement for the GIC IQ chip uh, from the generic IRQ chip structure. In this GIC IRQ chip, we have implemented a few of the functions like IRQ mask, unmask, IRQ get, IR, um, IRQ get IRQ chip state, IRQ set IRQ chip state. We will be seeing these two functions in the coming slide. So we can set or get the status of uh, interrupt using the given functions, which are part of IRQ chip structure. IRQ get chip state returns the current state of the interrupt. While using IRQ set chip state function, we can set the current status of the interrupt. And these are the current states. Uh, IRQ spending, IRQ active, IRQ masked, IRQ line level higher. Uh, so let us uh, go back to the slide of relation between uh, all these structures before going to the generic IRQ handling. So, uh, so as we saw, um, IRQ domain operation alloc allocate the IRQ desk structure with all the details. IRQ data is being passed down to IRQ chip functions. IRQ data also contains a pointer to IRQ chip and uh, IRQ domain structure and uh, IRQ data itself is nested inside IRQ DEX. So these, there is an uh, indirect link between these two using IRQ data. Now we will check how the generic interrupt framework handles the interrupt. So when the interrupt occurs, the low level I architecture code either call the handle IRQ function or it calls the generic handle IRQ desk function. Uh, though this generic handle IRQ desk function also calls the same handle IRQ function. And uh, this we will be seeing in the next slide. Based on different type of uh, trigger levels for interrupt, different actions may need to be taken care in each case. The high level IRQ flow handlers provide uh, the predefined approach to deal with the hardware interrupts. These flow handlers are assigned to the interrupt descriptor during device initialization or at boot time. A few of these uh, IRQ flow handlers are uh, like these handle simple IRQ, uh, which will handle the simple and software IRQ. We do not track the counts of interrupt, etc. for these IRQs. Then handle level IRQ is to handle level triggered interrupt, uh, level H IRQ is to handle the S triggered interrupts. Uh, handle per CPU is per CPU local interrupt handler. Uh, since this is local to a particular interrupt, uh, it doesn't need any locking mechanism. So whatever the functions best suit the interrupt handling, we can call that. Uh, let's say the selected flow handler is one of the high level, high level IRQ flow handlers. Then it may need to do few things before proceeding with the interrupt handling. For example, 
the interrupt handler um, interrupt controller may need to acknowledge the cpu to make sure that interrupt was properly received uh, so also we may need to enable or disable few of the interrupts from the chip so here comes the advantage of having generic structure that we have defined earlier and the flow handler don't need to know anything about uh, architecture specific details to accomplish these actions all of it can be done relying on irq chip abstraction which is which encapsulates the hardware relevant functions afterward the handle irq event function is called which sets the irq state as in progress and acquire the irq description lock and then calls handle irq event per cpu function uh, we will be looking this uh, handle irq event function in the coming slide um, but if we choose the handle uh, per cpu irq as a flow handler then the number of irq handled by the cpu is incremented and we can directly jump to handle irq event per cpu function that is instead of this function handle irq event and then calling the handle irq event per cpu uh, this handle irq event per cpu function is directly called inside handle uh, irq event per cpu uh, we call this function uh, that is underscore underscore handle irq event per cpu and uh, waits for it return uh, to add some randomness uh, this handle irq event per cpu uh, function is where the generic irq subsystem uh, takes the actions defined in the selected interrupt controller Uh, so we can say this is the main function uh, where inter um, interrupt controller specific handling occurs after all the actions are handled irq handled is return and uh, then hand this uh, ha underscore handle handle irq event per cpu returns the flag and these flag can be used to add randomness to the irq handling as mentioned earlier Uh, so as we discussed earlier we can see the generic handle irq this function uh, is calling the same handle irq function only here the handle irq event uh, when this function is called uh, this sets the irq state as in progress and uh, then acquire the lock and then call the handle irq event per cpu function once the handle irq event per cpu returns it clear the in progress status and the returns here we have another type of flow handler that is being used for uh, bad interrupts or we can say spurious interrupts uh, that we discussed in the interrupt type slides so for bad interrupts uh, it print many of the irq descriptors uh, then increase the interrupt count and acknowledges the bad irq this ack bad irq function uh implementation is uh, architecture specific uh, that it that is uh, it depends on a different architecture how they want to acknowledge these bad interrupts um let us quickly have a recap of what we understood about generic interrupt flow working so when the interrupt occurs the handle iq function is stored in iq disk structure which is directly called or we can also call the generic handle iq res function handle iq event sets the iq state as in progress acquire the iq description lock and then call handle iq event per cpu inside handle iq event per cpu function we call underscore underscore handle iq event per cpu and add some randomness to the pool of interrupts handled by the cpu underscore underscore handle irq event per cpu takes all the actions based on irq disk required for the interrupt and then clear the interrupt to handle the spurious or bad interrupts we call handle irq bad function uh now we will understand a few generic interrupt apis that can be called from device driver directly without the need to know how they are implemented so first is request irq that uh, this adds a handler for interrupt line um here irq the first parameter is the interrupt number the second parameter handler is a function pointer to the actual interrupt handler that will service this interrupt 
Um, here the return type is uh, IRQ handler T. So if the return value is IRQ handle, it indicates the processing is completed successfully. But if the value is IRQ none, it indicates the processing failed. The third parameter uh, IRQ flags might be either zero or bit mask of one or more flags. Uh, we will see the different interrupt uh, flags in the coming slide. The fourth parameter is the device name. Uh, this is, uh, these texts are associated with a uh, slash proc IRQ or proc interrupts for communication with user space. And finally, the fifth parameter is device ID, which is particularly used for shared interrupts. We can pass null here if the line is not shared, but we must pass a unique device ID, uh, which is used to differentiate between multiple handlers for shared interrupt. Free IRQ uh, interrupt freeze the uh, free IRQ freeze the interrupt allocated using request IRQ. So uh, here we remove the interrupt handler, and uh, if the interrupt line is no longer in use by any of the driver, that then that line is also disabled. Uh, then enable IRQ enables the handling of interrupt. Disable IRQ is used to disable the selected interrupt line. This function waits for ending any pending IRQ handler for this interrupt to complete before returning. Disable IRQ no sync. Uh, so unlike disable IRQ, this function does not ensure existing instances of IRQ handler has been completed before returning. Uh, there are many other type of hardware, uh, uh, high level driver APIs like uh, IRQ set type, uh, which sets the interrupt type for interrupt, then request MNMI, um, this allocates a interrupt line, especially for non-maskable interrupt delivery and many more. Another sets of APIs is in IRQ and uh, in interrupt. These are used to check if we are currently in the interrupt handler. Sorry. Uh, then for disabling all the interrupts, we can use local IRQ save and uh, local IRQ disable APIs. A call to local IRQ save disables interrupt delivery on the current processor, but it will save the current interrupt stage into the flags. While uh, the local IRQ disable disables the interrupt delivery without saving the interrupt stage. Interrupt flags are only used by the kernel as a part of interrupt handling routine. All these available flags in the interrupt subsystem are defined in Linux interrupt.h file. Uh, let us discuss a few of the important flags. IRQF shared. Uh, this flag allows sharing of uh, IRQ among different uh, devices. Uh, sim uh, simply, we can say that we use uh, this flag for shared interrupts. Then we have IRQF timer, uh, which uh, marks the interrupt as timer interrupt, then IRQF per CPU. So this signifies the interrupt is per CPU and then IRQF no suspend signifies that we should not disable this IRQ during suspend operation. Uh, and there are so many flags here, like you can see. Uh, special one IRQF no balancing is used to exclude this interrupt from interrupt balancing. Uh, by interrupt balancing, we means uh, we will distribute the hardware interrupt across the processor to improve the system performance. And uh, then we have uh, many other flex like IRQF no auto N uh, that signifies that don't enable the IRQ automatically with the user request. User will explicitly enable it if it's on using enable IRQ or enable NMI functions later. Uh, NMI is a non-maskable interrupt. Uh, let us take a simple example to understand how device driver use these generic APIs. Here, the WDT device driver, uh, we can see WDT init function called the generic uh, API of request IRQ to register the interrupt. Uh, so here we can see uh, there are the same parameters. Uh, this way, generic interrupt subsystem help in, uh, helps in the implementation of interrupt handler without the need of knowing the inter, uh, internal details. Here IRQ is the interrupt number, then WDT interrupt is the interrupt handler, uh, 
Uh, also, the no, no flags are set because the third uh, parameter is zero. Uh, then uh, this WDT501P is a device name of the device associated with the interrupt. And the null is passes with the argument that indicates the interrupt is not shared. Then when the WDT exit, uh, we will uh, free the IRQ handler by calling this free IRQ and passing the same interrupt number that we used in request IRQ. Now we have few slides to show how interrupt look like from the user space. PROCFS interrupt uh, interface shows all the active IRQs. Uh, PROC IRQ is the directory uh, which is used to set CPU affinity for a particular interrupt. As we discussed earlier, affinity allows the system to connect to a particular IRQ. Uh, and this is uh, like uh, affi affini uh, affinity allows to, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me. Affinity allows the system to connect to a particular IRQ to only one CPU, or it can exclude a CPU from handling any other IRQs as well. Uh, SMP affinity is a bit mask in which we can specify which CPUs can handle the IRQs just by writing it by a user space. For example, here, the default SMP affinity, which was set to FF, here we change it to one by directly writing the value to H. It means that only the first CPU now will handle this IRQ. Uh, the default SMP affinity mask applies to all the non-active IRQs, which are the IRQ that has not been allocated or activated, and uh, hence they'll also like the PROC IRQ directory. Uh, here example of those inactive IRQs are, uh, we can see from 20 to 36, uh, then 51, 53, etc. In this slide, we will see how interrupts look like from user space. We can see all the interrupts detailed by checking the proc interrupt file. Here, first column is the IQ number for each interrupt. IQ number determines the priority uh, of the interrupt that needs to be handled by the CPU. A smaller IQ number means higher priority. Uh, then we have columns stating how many times the CPU core has been interrupted in a multi-core system. Here we can see by default, most of the interrupts are handled by core zero only, like you can see here. So uh, by default, all the interrupts will run on core zero, but we can change the affinity of uh, these interrupts by writing to the SMP affinity. Uh, then we have the uh, IRQ chip name. Uh, these are the hardware uh, IRQ number that is local interrupt controller number. Then the type of interrupt and the interrupt handler. Uh, here we can see a few IPIs. Uh, these are the interprocessor interrupt at the very last. Uh, an interprocessor interrupt IPI is a special type of interrupt by which one processor may interrupt the another processor in the multiprocessor system. If the interrupting processor requires some actions from the another processor, uh, the interrupting, uh, the interprocessor interrupt allows CPU to send interrupt signals to another processor in the system. So the IPI is not delivered uh, through a line as you can see, but directly as a message. Uh, we can expose interrupt information through SysFS interface also, as you can see. Uh, the information of interrupts is also exposed uh, via proc interrupts. Then why the SysFS interrupt uh, was deleted? Because the format of the file, this file has been changed uh, over kernel versions and differ across the different architecture. Also, it has a varying calling number name uh, depending on the hardware, like if say it is a, a single core, then there will be just CPU zero. Uh, so uh, the format varies from hardware to hardware and this make it very hard to parse. Uh, to solve this, uh, we expose the information through SysFS. Uh, so each IRQ attribute is in a separate file uh, 
so it can be parsed in a consistent machine parsable way. Here we can see all the descriptors are present like IRQ, actions, chip name, hardware IRQ, name, wake up, etc. Uh, but this feature is only available when config sparse IRQ and uh, config sys, uh, sys, uh, config sys FS is enabled. Uh, these many um, configurations also need to be enabled uh, for debugging interrupts. After we enable all the debugging configurations for interrupt as discussed in previous slide, we can debug a lot of things. Uh, we can see a handler for a particular IQ number. We can see the status. What is the current status? What are all the flags set? What is the common IRQ data state? Uh, what is the CPU affinity for the interrupt? Uh, what is the domain name? Uh, what is the hardware IRQ number? That is the local interrupt number and much more. So there are many things to debug uh, if we enable the debugfs interface and uh, some configurations are shown. With this, I conclude my presentation uh, on understanding Linux interrupt subsystem. And I hope this would be useful for deeper insights into Linux interrupt subsystem. I thank you all for being with me till the very last. So any questions? Thank you.